So this whole suicide thing just didn't work. And then I decided, oh, you know what, let me just become a prostitute. We may look different and live in different countries, yet our stories are knitted with the same threads of excitement, uncertainties, challenges, and victories. As we journey through the ups and downs of life, it is our undeniable will and God's strength that propel us to joy after pain, smile after frowns, and ups after downs. We were born to win. We were destined to greatness. We are overcomers. Welcome to God's Scoops, Raw and Unedited Stories. Welcome to Raw and Unedited Stories, where stories are shared to uplift, encourage, and brighten your day. With us today is a woman all the way from South Africa a mother, caregiver, a political activist for the rights of women and children in her country. Fatima, welcome to Raw and Unedited Stories. How are you today? Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored and privileged to be on this platform and thank you for considering me as part of your program. I am doing fantastic. God is good and he is still in control, although human beings are trying to control this world according to their will and wishes. We thank God that he is still on the throne. Amen. Fatima, before you start telling us your story, just tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, um, where, you, where you're from exactly in South Africa. Okay. So I am in Gauteng. We've got nine provinces. And I am in the main, the smallest province, which is called Gauteng. Everything happens here. It is also the, the province with the most people. So, so legislature, everything that needs to be approved and stuff is done in this province. I live between two cities. Um, I am born and raised in, uh, or actually I'm raised in Pretoria, which is the governing um, city and then I do a lot of work. I'm actually in council in Johannesburg, where that is one of our main cities as well. So I moved between the two cities. And how it happened was, um, I think as a child already, I was very much aware of um, stuff that's happening around me. You know, we come from a country that was under a government that used something called apartheid, which was a system to oppress the original people, the Africans from this continent, from this country. So um, that is the background, that is the history. So we are out of it now, 28 years later, but we are still not free. We still don't know, don't experience the freedom that our uh, parents and their parents fought for. So as a child, I was already aware of the unfairness during apartheid. I still had a few drops of apartheid in my life. I could still not go to certain shops and do whatever I wanted to do. But as I grew older, um, I became part of, um, you know, I was more aware because I'm an adult. And right now, I'm in a position where I can say a lot. I can I can use my influence. At some stage, I became an actress. And that's just one of the talents that I have. I'm a good actress. I can interpret characters. So I did some television work. But while I was doing television work, it actually disturbed me that there were so many things happening in my community. So I was between stage which is fictional and reality which is in my township we call, we live in uh, places called townships mm -hmm. okay so um and because i was so aware of it i used my acting skills to address certain things i would write plays that addressed certain uh issues that's in the in our communities and so on and so on i used those skills i'm still using it but in a different way Two years ago, no, actually more than two years ago, I started using social media, which is um, platforms like Facebook, 
to speak against what I felt was unfair, what what was um, not right for our people, and, and and stuff like that. And then more and more, I didn't actually realize that that is going to happen. That more and more people started watching me. And then I became an influencer. Then I became a voice for the people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Until such a time, like last year, a political party actually saw my potential, saw that I could add value to the party itself. And the party is called the United Independent Movement, a fresh party, a, a new party. In fact, when I joined, the party was, was about four to five months old. But I gravitated to the party because what I stood for and what the party is standing for actually matched. And, and those are the values, um, which is word-based. We are God-based. We want to bring back the capital. It's, we call it the five Cs. Mm. Uh, Christ, number one bringing back capital because our people are impoverished because our government officials are hmm, busy with all sorts of fraudulent uh, activities which actually steals the money out of our people's month, mouth. We want to bring back, um, it's the capital, it's Christ, it's our constitution. Our constitution is quite solid, but there's a lot of things that is not done according to the constitution. And then corruption, we want to get rid of corruption in every way possible because our country is flooded and infested with corruption. And that is also why there's so much poverty around. We are a very rich country and not one person is supposed to sleep without food. But that it has become the order of the day. So I'm a mother. Yes. I've become a mother for, I've got two biological children. They are grown up. But I, I see children around me that are suffering already because of the actions of the adults. And I just feel that if I don't address it, that we, our generation needs to address what is being done to children right now because those children will become will be adults within the next 10 to 20 years yes. and we we will be the senior citizens so if we don't address the problem now what type of adults will we be having as senior citizens because then we are dependent on them to protect us so basically that is it in my long explanation why i am part of the solution i would say Phenomenal, phenomenal, Fatima. And you have already said so much that you are doing for the women and children and also even your community in South Africa. Now, just tell us, how did you get involved in um, protecting girls and women? How did you get involved in that? Okay. So it, it also happened very organically you know people latch on to certain types of people so i always had women coming to me talking about them being abused or you know in that line and women would start talking to me and i would um just be an ear a sounding board for them to come to and speak to and then later on children started doing the same and now of late, it's become even more uh, prevalent that more and more women and children are coming to the fore, telling me what their situations are. I have, we started an organization called the Lioness Pride Movement, which is a movement for, that started by women, women who don't even know each other, but we've yeah. got the same. Uh, reason and that is to make a difference in women and children's lives so formally what we do is if there's a need a woman is in crisis she doesn't have food uh, resources and stuff uh, we actually we raise funds not as much as we should but out of our own pockets we we contribute and so on and then we would give the ladies something or help them to write out their cvs or if a lady needs 
help right now. She's running away from a partner that wants to hurt her. We work with other people that provide safe houses. Um, there's women that have, they've got cases against their partners or people that are abusing them. We follow up on those cases and keep the South African police services accountable. It's a tedious task because they give us the runaround, but we just, we just very uh, persistent in our search for justice. I would do interviews. Last week I did an interview of a woman who was uh, attempted rape by her colleague. She's a lady teacher and her fellow teacher almost raped her. And then he continued to sexually arrest her in the workplace. Right now she's out of work because mentally it was just too much for her. But he's living a beautiful life continues with his uh, education, uh, uh, career and so on. So now I am working with a lawyer that is going to put that guy, um, he needs to pay for what he has done. Justice needs to be served. So we do things like that. Lots of awareness creation um, when it comes to children's rights as well. Uh, part the past few weeks we've been, I've been part of, parents that are taking the school governing body and the principal and the Department of Education to task for not addressing certain things in school. For instance, a male teacher who physically attacked a female teacher, nothing happened, mm -hmm. he continued to teach at that school. Then this year, he attacked another teacher and the child, and so we were like, this needs to stop. So we've escalated the situation to the necessary department. So those are, it's a very practical hands-on um, involvement that I have where women and children's rights are concerned. I also do workshops, whether it is online workshops or interpersonal workshops to make ladies aware of their rights. But mm -hmm. because I, I'm not a lawyer, I make use of paralegals and lawyers and, and people like that to give the people the information because most of the times people suffer because they don't know their rights. Yes. And Fatima, how do you get support for your programs? Support, you mean financial support? Yes. Yes. We don't have financial support. As I said, we, we contribute from our own pockets and we have little... Uh, uh, fundraising events and, and stuff. We've never formally applied for, for funds from private or government organizations. We actually stay away from government organizations. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't trust them. The minute they start funding you, they want to control you and we don't want that. We will um, start, I think we've wanted to make inroads first to have proof that this is what we have been doing. So now we can go to organizations and give them a document to say, this is what we've been doing for the past year. Mm -hmm. our so now we can ask for, for funding. All right. So since the abolition of apartheid in uh, South Africa, what is uh, happening to our children uh, in terms of schooling uh, and in the homes uh, in, in that region? Well... It's actually very sad that we are, and I'm going to say it very blatantly, the current government mm -hmm. under the African National Congress, which is the ANC, which was once upon a time a party which that we really trusted. I, at one stage, voted for the ANC because we thought, yay, they were going to bring us some freedom and stuff, which didn't happen. That was the ANC of Nelson Mandela and still the ANC of Thabo Mbeki. Those are the two previous presidents that we have. But then it changed when uh, Jacob Zuma took over. Then it changed even worse when Cyril Ramaphosa took over. So the ANC government of today, the Department of Education under the leadership of a woman called Angie Mucheha, they are doing the following. Number one, they don't build schools, new schools, especially in rural areas, which is very much needed. Our children are still dying 
because they fall into pit toilets. I don't know if you know what a pit toilet is, but it is a toilet where there's just a hole with something placed over for a child to sit and sometimes our children fall into it. Mm. Last week, last week we lost 19 children between the ages of five and I think 14. They were in a bucky, a, a, a van on their way to school and a truck bumped into them, 19 children gone because the Department of Education, the Department of Transport, the Department of Infrastructure is not doing their jobs in number one, building schools for our children in the areas where they grow up so that they don't have to get into unsafe vehicles. So now they have to travel for hours. Our babies have to get up five o'clock in the morning to be at a school half past seven in the morning. Then the education system itself is pathetic. Um, she has dropped the education or the passing rate percentage to 30%, where when I was at school, which is about 30 years ago, the lowest mark that you were supposed to get was 50%. That was the lowest mark. Mm -hmm. Now, now you can actually pass with a 30%. Our children are illiterate. That is, mm. why I, that is why I started a, an aftercare center because I realized that the children around me cannot read. They don't know how to count. They don't know how to write. These are primary school children. So that's the one thing. So education has dropped. Um, the quality of teachers have dropped. I'm not generalizing because they are good teachers but most of the teachers are substandard teachers because they don't go to proper, uh, um, they go to proper, but they go, they don't get proper exposure and experience on how to teach children. The system is made in such a way that the parents get a book to say, this is what the homework is that your child must do, but the child was never taught what mm -hmm. it is. That mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The children are being taught what is it? CSE. Um, something sex education. I forget the name now, what the C stands for. But the sex education, for whatever reason, I don't know. Comprehensive, that's the word. Comprehensive sex education, which is something that is from the UK, from uh, UNICEF, um, UNICEF mm -hmm. and I don't know organization they uh, have proposed all of this we resisted it we resisted it I was part of a group of hundreds of people that were marching we said we don't want CSE in our schools why must a nine-year-old learn about sexual positions about uh, explicit things that is not suitable for a nine or eight year old but our children are being taught all of this at school wow and, uh, is the argument is yeah but children are already sexually active and my <laughs> argument is but why not teach our children that their bodies are the, the, the temple of god <laughs> and why they should wait and you know all of those things the old-fashioned things that we were taught now the other argument would be but no but children are exposed to all of this at, uh, on social media parents should be taught don't expose your child to social media on such a level etc etc Mm. Now, here, here's the cherry on the cake. A few weeks ago, she suggested that we have a maternity section at school for children to give birth. So now our schools are being turned into maternity wards where babies are going to have babies. So they first conscientize children to have sex. Children then have sex, they get babies, then they are giving birth to other babies. And that is the state of our children today. My mm. opinion is I think our children are being used or conscientized or pacified into becoming little slaves. But that's just me, you know, mm. things from a different perspective. Because mm. why is it? And for the education system to focus on stuff like that. 
How about teaching our children how to read, write, and count? Mm. How, how to manufacture stuff? How to invent stuff? Things that children in the UK and China and all those places are doing. Why must we as African children learn about sex? Um, Fatima, what are mothers and grandmothers doing in those communities to protect these young children? So would you say it's a cycle? Yeah. I think the cycle of slavery is so deeply entrenched that, especially in your rural areas, your poor area, that they believe that whatever is said from government, whatever the system is suggesting, it is okay. It is fine. So they don't retaliate. The, the majority of people in South Africa are African, obviously. Poor, they are uneducated, and those are the children that are being targeted. Also, the middle class children, if the parents are not participating or involved in their children's, in the school or in the education system, then they also let it slide. You will find pockets of parents retaliating and addressing it. Mm -hmm. um, Fatima, t tell us, do you, do you experience any pushback from the government officials or community leaders from what you're doing? No, I don't, I don't experience any pushback, but there's also an attitude of they ignoring they are ignoring our plight. They just don't address it. And that's the easy way. So instead of pushing back, um, they just don't do anything about it. There wow. are certain trees that we can claim, and that is the fact that we have been retaliating and resisting the compulsory, uh, mandatory jabbing of our people without informing them thoroughly of what the jabs, the, va the so-called vaccinations are all about. So there's, there's lots of organizations that are, we're going the, 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 the legal route and we are taking on certain government um, ministers and, and, and departments and stuff like that. But, so then they have to, you know, react or retaliate and so on and so on. I think if an organization or two or three or five or a hundred takes the Department of Health, uh, well, health as well, takes the Department of Education to court to say we are resisting this because of one, two, three. These are the legal um, things that you are not adhering to. Then, yeah, then we will we will win ground. But so far, mm -mm, it hasn't happened yet. There isn't a strong enough organization <clears throat> that is fighting for our children. Yes. Um, Fatima, how do you integrate your Christian belief into all the act, the, the work, the lobbying work that you're doing um, for women and children? Um, everything that I do is Christian based. It's, I am motivated by my, my belief system, my, the fact that I believe that our country should be run with godly based values. Uh, Christ says it in the word that suffer the little children to come unto him, but theirs is the kingdom come. And anybody that does anything to harm the little children, uh, you have a huge curse on yourself, and it's just as well you put a, 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 a what, I don't know what's the English name, but in Afrikaans, a, a, a clip around your head. Mm -hmm. around your, we dive into, into the deep blue sea. So don't what, harm. What are some programs that you implement to kind of foster spiritual growth and, 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 and influence in the lives of these women and children? I have, as I, yeah, I mentioned uh, we have workshops and, and it's always, see, I don't have, I won't say we're now going to have a Christian workshop on how to rear your children and stuff. I will just call it a workshop, parent-to-parent -parent workshop. Mm -hmm. But in workshop, 
the word is always ingrained and worked in without them even realizing it. But I do say, everybody knows that I come from a Christian perspective. So whatever I do is, is Christ-based, it's word-based. And I can't do anything without it being a Christ-based um, initiative. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you get support from the church? Yeah, not not formally, but we do get support from individuals within the church um, world, pastors and and teachers and those people. They are there to, to support us. But I don't work with a specific church because I want to be as interdenominational as possible. And I get I also get asked by non-Christian um communities to to come and assist i work with the hindu community i work with the muslim community because what they see is someone who just uh shows love and but when they engage with me i'm very um uh, open and blunt to say that this is when i speak i speak from the perspective of a christian yes my my book of guidance is the Bible. And they haven't retaliated yet because for them it's about what they can get out of it. And mm -hmm. my approach is very, um, it's with humility, never with uh, pride and with the attitude of, I am a Christian and you are a sinner because I'm also a sinner. I'm just a servant. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So Fatima, if I was a little girl, Living in South Africa, I would love to meet you. I see that you are such a phenomenal woman and um, for your community and Thank influence you. the community. How did you become a Christian? I grew up as a Christian. Um, very interesting story, but I must tell you. So my, my parents are mixed race. My father is Indian Muslim. My mom is Khoi, or what we would call here in South Africa, mixed race Christian. So they got married, they conceived me, but my dad was under, pre under pressure by his family to leave this non-Muslim wife of his while she was still pregnant. So he left her, went to Cape Town, another province, and he never came back and she thought he will come back. So she gave birth to me and um, asked him what she should name me. And he gave her all his family names, Fatima, Khrushche, Bibi, that's his mother's name and his sister's name and his aunt's name. So I inherited names uh, when I was born, but she never brought me up as a Muslim because I think that was part of the... The, the, the tension between them because she wouldn't, uh, because she was a staunch Roman Catholic woman. So she wouldn't give up her religion and he wouldn't give up his religion. So I grew up um, Catholic. But because I'm such an inquisitive child and, and I think God just, God's hand, his hand was over me when I was a girl of about, I think, six, no, 10 years old. I, I I did all the things that you do as a, as a Catholic child. I went for my first Holy Communion, communi uh, confirmation and all of those things. And then I said to the priest that I want to be a, a, a teacher, Sunday school teacher. So at the age of 13, I was already a Sunday school teacher because I love God and I love the word and so on. And then the Holy Spirit, I know it, it, it was the Holy Spirit then, he just made me aware of a lot of things. Then I needed more information. I asked the priest more questions about God, about Christ. And I asked, why must we, why must I pray to Mary? Because Mary was just the mother. Jesus is the main figure in this whole story, etc., etc. They couldn't answer me. And then I stayed away from church for, I think, a year, a year, two. Then I asked God, Lord, a lot of things happened to me. Um, someone uh, attempted to rape me, but I got away. Um, my stepfather at some stage 
uh, when I was about 11, 12 years old, he sexually molested me. Um, I hated my mother because I felt she didn't protect me when I told her what was happening. So there's a lot of turmoil inside of me. And one day when I was about 16 years old, yes, 16 years old, I wanted to commit suicide because I just felt my life doesn't make sense. I don't know what am I doing here. And um, all that happened was I ended up with a very bad stomach. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. I drank a lot of things. And the next morning, my stomach was in pain and so this whole suicide thing just didn't work and then i decided oh, you know what let me just become a prostitute because it seems like my body is the only thing that is useful in this whole situation mm. and two weeks before i actually went there is a zone in johannesburg it's it's hillbrow where mostly uh prostitutes are working so i actually went there to see how they work, where they stand, what they do, what they, you know, the whole thing. And I thought to myself, okay, next week I am going. And in that week, I just had this outburst where I asked God, you know, if you really exist, just show me that you love me and you exist a little. Just so show me something. And that was in the in the, in the intimacy of my bedroom again. And that is where I actually experienced God. I I just had this whole presence, this whole life experience and and a warmth overwhelming. And I cried like a baby. I just cried and sobbed because I knew that there's a God and he's listening to me somewhere. And that's where my, my walk with God actually started. There's a church across my mother's house. The next morning I went to that church. And while the preacher was still talking, I felt that someone told him my whole life story. I was very confused. I thought, how does this no man know my life? He was speaking about me. And while he was still talking, I just stood up and went to the front, cried. And I said, whatever you need, you guys need to do, I, I want to be part of this whole family setup this whole God thing. I want to be what started my relationship with Christ. Amen. Amen. That's awesome, Fatima. And I just thank you for just being that woman of change, that dynamic woman in your community and how you lobby for women and children and other rights as well. But before we even close this session, I want you to just use this forum to speak to women across the world. Anything that you want to say to them? Um, for some reason, well, while you were talking, I saw the, the, the picture of, of Hagar, the, the woman that was brought in as the concubine to bear Ishmael and when things didn't go work out accordingly because of you know it just didn't work out two women in one house it's just not going to work out um she was cast out but God even in the state where she was as a woman that was like so many women they are cast out with their children they have to fend for themselves no one is there to look after them God came and in her cry and ignorance of who God really was, he is the one that actually revealed himself to her by providing for her. So my encouragement, because I am a single mother, I've been a single mother for the past 20 years, 21 years. I've seen how God has intervened for me, how he has taken control of every situation where I could not um, do anything. So my encouragement to every woman right now, every mother, is trust God 100%. Don't waver, don't doubt anyway. Just trust Him 100%. In your weakness, in your state of depression, in your state of desperation, 
just trust God. Amen. Thank you, Fatima. And one more thing. Do you, do you have anything to say to the government or the officials who are able to make the change in your community at this point? Yeah, well, I've got a lot to say to them. <laughs> uh, but if I had all of them here in front of me, I, because half of them don't believe in God, half of them are communists, half of them are new ages, half of them are atheists. So I have to speak to the spirit man first. And so what I would say to them is that there is a loving God and this, if they can just heed to their spirit man that is always searching for something better to connect with, which is the, the great spirit of God, is that they must listen to that. And whatever they do here on earth, it will come back to them, maybe not directly, but to the next generation or the generation thereafter. And that they should not feed their selfish flesh because all that is driving them right now is their selfish flesh to satisfy mammon. And the word of God, if you cannot serve both God and man, and right now that is what the, the situation is. And I'm also going to be very blunt with them and tell them this is end times. Because I'm an, I'm an end time messenger. This is end times. If you don't have a re relationship with God right now, you will be lost. Mm. All the riches, all the influential mm. positions and power mm. is nothing if you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Mm. That's it. Thank you. Fatima, how can we support the girls and women in South Africa? Um, there's different ways that you can support them. We have different drives. Oh, I forgot to talk about um, I've got something called a community closet and I'm encouraging women that are connected to me to have the same thing in their communities. A community closet consists of clothing that a woman can wear when she goes for it and she takes it. She doesn't rent it. She doesn't buy it. She comes, she, she chooses it. It hangs on a rail very nicely. She chooses the clothes. She takes it, goes for an interview, goes to work with it. Then there's clothes for um, events and stuff. And also clothes for just if you don't have clothes. I've got mothers who are pregnant. They don't have clothes. They don't have clothes for their babies. So I collect clothes. So that's one of the things that can be done. I will never say... We don't need money because sometimes we have to drop off these things. Money is good to have, but people don't need money. People need food. People need clothes. People need a place to stay. And yes, money buys all of that. But essentially, it's more providing the resources. Um, we also support the gender-based violence uh, sections in the South African police services. When a woman is sexually assaulted and all the proof and swaps have been done, she wants to shower. She wants to get rid of the filth on her body. So they've requested for towels and just a nice gift bag with, you know, sanitary pads, um, soap, roll-on, you know, toiletries, just to make her feel like a woman again. And children, we collect school stationery for them we collect um toys for them because children are children doesn't matter where they live they want a little doll or a car to play with so those are the things that that, that we actually need do you and a long list of, of things that we need is shelters and stuff like that do you have a contact number yes um the most common number that most people have is South African code will be plus 27. So it's plus 27, uh, 71, 242, 9795. So it's 071, 
242-942-9795. Well, thank you, Fatima. Thank you for joining us on Raw and Unedited Stories. Thank you for your story and thank you for all you do. Bless God for a woman like you. Thank you. And to our God Scoop community, thank you for tuning in to Raw and Unedited Stories. And listen, if you want to hear more stories like these where we help people, please subscribe and like, share. If you have a story to tell, we know everyone has a story. Please contact us in the description button below and we will reach out to you. Please have a phenomenal day.